Welcome back to the ProWorks channel. My name is John. Thank you to Carbide3D for sponsoring this video in which I'll be showing you how I made a little wall cabinet using the next evolution of my Dado routing jig. Before we get to the CNC and jig, I prepared the material for my outer casework. This is going to be a small square, about 15 inches by 15 inches. The outer material will be a half inch thick, the vertical divider is 3 eighths of an inch thick, and the horizontal is about a quarter inch thick. The material I'm using for the casework is sapili and it's quarter sawn so it's nice and stable and I didn't have to worry about any knots or tension in the wood which can be annoying with other species. Okay so what does carbide 3D and CNC machines have to do with a little wall cabinet? I typically don't let the CNC overshadow or have too much influence in my work but I do treat it like any other tool in the shop and tools are meant to make certain processes quicker, more precise, and more efficient. Oftentimes, I like using it to make jigs and templates, because I can't make those accurately otherwise. I had been using my Shape Oko 3 for over 5 years and was plenty happy with it, and I was even more happy when Carbide 3D sent me the upgraded Shape Oko Pro. I decided to show it off a bit in this video and detail how I designed the next evolution of my Dado routing jig. If you've seen some of my past videos, you'll know I use custom jigs like this, this, and this for each project to route accurate dados. What you're looking at here is a drawing of the adjustable jig in Carbide Create, which allows me to create tool paths so I can cut this out on the Shape Oko. Up here is an example of one of my older jigs, which has a static 3 inch spacing. So if you want to cut dados that are 3 inches apart, this is the jig for you. But even then, the dados have to be 3 eighths of an inch wide, or else the jig is a little bit off. So if you need something other than that, you'll need to use a different jig, and that's where this adjustable one will come in handy. Right here that I have highlighted is a large void in the jig, and that is intended to be filled with these inserts down here. So to start off with, I have eight inserts, and the rectangle in the middle holds the guide bushing, and you can see that rectangle moves over a little bit as we go over from A to H. In H, it's in the middle, and on A, it's to the far left, and that just gives me a sixteenth of an inch uh, incremental spacing for each one. So that means I can tackle pretty much any spacing I need for different dado spacing. So if we put A up here, it'll slip into the jig, and then we can put B up here, and then you can even flip over this one. C is upside down, and now we're referencing off the other side of C. We can put it over here, and off the top of my head, I don't know what this spacing would give you, but ahead of time, you can calculate which one you need and get the spacings you need for your project. And you can do this on both sides of the jig if you need to do double-sided dados. And the great thing about this type of jig is that if you make a mistake down the road or want to recreate a project years from now, you can always slip these inserts back into the jig and get the exact same spacing that you had previously. Hopefully that explanation gave you somewhat of an understanding of what I'm cutting out. I'll start with the main body of the jig here, which consists of a top and bottom panel, as well as some spacers of different thicknesses. I'm using an eighth inch compression bit and cutting this half inch Baltic birch in just three passes. I could probably push it a little harder, but this material isn't cheap and I wasn't really in too much of a hurry. Once the toolpath is complete, I can remove the piece from the spoil board, cut my tabs, and then work on the fit of the inserts. As precise as a CNC machine can be, there is still some trial and error to get the exact fit you need for your specific situation. In this case, I needed to test out the slot size so that the guide bushing fit perfectly. I don't want it to be too snug that I can't move it, but I also don't want any play side to side. I also wanted to figure out the right fit for the inserts so that, so that they fit into the jig nicely without slipping through with, and also without deforming the jig. This first test piece here fit in a little too loose. There's a little bit too much play side to side, and that'll just create some error with your dados as you move the guide bushing up and down the jig. So I went into Carbide Create and created some offsets on my drawing so that I could make this a little bit larger by a few thousandths of an inch each time. And you can see here that I was also testing out the guide bushings to see which fit was right. I'll see which one I like, make note of it, and then adjust my drawing as needed when I cut out the real thing. And then you can see here I tested out all of my inserts. I ended up doing three of them. I might have done four after this, but I can't remember exactly. And you can see these first two were a little too loose, and this last one was just right what I was looking for. It doesn't fall through, and it's just snug enough to get in there without too much effort. After I determined the correct sizes, I updated my drawing and sent the file back to the Shape Oko. I decided to combine two different bits in one toolpath this time the same compression bit as before for the contour cuts, and then a V-bit for engraving the letters in each insert. Carbide 3D's bit setter makes it pretty simple to change bits in the middle of a toolpath, which is what you see me doing here. 
This maintains the same Z height even though I'm inserting the bit at a different point in the router. And for those curious, the font I chose is from the TV show Bluey because it's the best. All right, this is the jig in sort of a default state. I just have a big open space here ready for some inserts so I can customize the dados as I need. I have inserts on the bottom here just so that the workpiece doesn't fall through, uh, but I'll bring you in a little closer just to show you how I put these in place. One thing I forgot to mention is I also have my cam levers here which locks this in place. I went over that in a previous video and I did not add these to my drawing, but I did drill the holes manually after the fact. And I have a little shim here so that the cam lever can work with different size uh, materials. So. Uh, for the inserts on my card here, for the top and bottom panels, I have B4 and D12. So I'll take insert B and I'll put it on the fourth hump. So one, two, three, four. And I'll put the insert right there. And then D12. So four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. And with a three eighths inch bit, that should give me the exact spacing I need for my dividers on the top and bottom panels. For the bottom panel, I'll have to swap these over in reference off this side because the top and bottom panels are just mirror images of each other. So I'll go ahead and get these cut and then get the bottom panel set up as well. All right, just made those first cuts and I already made a mistake, but that's okay because it'll just alter the design slightly. So for this insert D, I had it in the right spot but I was supposed to have it the other way around. I was supposed to have the fatter side on this side, uh, but I had it like this. That's okay, so each of these inserts have two offsets, and you can reference off either one just so that I have less inserts to deal with. So there's eight inserts, and they each have two offsets for 16 different offsets, and they're each in a 16th of an inch increment. I know that's a mouthful, but that's what it's at right now. So made a mistake, it's just gonna move the vertical divider on the right side over a little bit, that's okay. So I'll go ahead and get these set up for the bottom panel. And if I didn't mention it already, this is just for a little bit of support for the routers. This is gonna be my right side panel, and for right I need to do G2, and I need to do upside down, so I double checked so I don't make the same mistake again. There's G2, and then C6 as well, that has to be upside down. So one, two, three, four, five, six. So it's gonna be right next to it. And this should give me a three and a half inch spacing and three and a half inch spacing. Or three inch spacing and three inch spacing. So let's go with that. And for the last piece of the outside panel, we have the left panel, and that's gonna have four dados that are two and a quarter inches apart. So I made a custom insert for that because I just figured it was the easiest route, and I think with the inserts I have, it wouldn't have been able to do this type of spacing so close together. So that is another good thing about the CNC is I can just make a custom insert for whatever spacing I need if I don't wanna use the regular inserts. So I'll just put this one in place and start routing. Not even gonna lie, made another mistake. These are supposed to be down here. That's okay. Before I cut the rest of the dados, I need to get these dividers fit into the case properly. So I'm using a test stick here to get the right height. I'll just sneak up on that with a couple test cuts and you can see that this is the exact fit that I'm looking for. Once I have that dialed in, I can go back to the table saw and get the two dividers cut to that exact length. You can see the type of fit that I'm going for here. After a little bit of sanding and some glue, this will be just perfect. 
and then I'll mark some lines with a pencil to see where the dados stop and start on these dividers so that I can reference off my jig with that line. All right, so now it's time to route the dados on the vertical divider. So I already have my big insert here. This is gonna be the left divider, so it's gonna to correspond to that left panel with the two and a quarter inch spacing. So I'll just keep this here. We're gonna reference off this side. So as I flip the jig over, now I need to reference off this side because I flipped it over. So I'll take out, I can leave these inserts in here because I'm going to be working down over here, so I'll kind of take these ones out for now. And my drawing says I need to use A13, and I need to have the skinny side facing the reference side. So I'll flip it over, I'll go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, and I'll slip it in there. And I'll put this one here just for support for the router, and uh, maybe I'll move this one over for router support as well. The reason I like the blank one is that I can't accidentally make a groove here. This one I could accidentally plunge in here, but hopefully that doesn't happen. So I'll go ahead and get this clamped up and uh, cut my grooves. I must have skipped filming the last divider, but anyway, all of the dados are cut and the adjustable jig has done its job. There were definitely hiccups along the way, but that's part of the process of creating something like this. This is a learning process and every time I used it, I tried to make note of things that could be improved. For one, when the cam levers are locked in place, they press the front and back of the jig apart, which makes the fit of the inserts looser, which is detrimental to the accuracy of the dados as well as the ease of use when flipping the jig over. When I flipped the jig over, some of the inserts were coming loose and falling out, and that kind of just erased all of the work I did with the trial and error of getting those inserts to fit nicely. So that's something I'll have to think about going forward, along with a couple other issues I may address at the end of the video. Moving on with the rest of the build, I can get some of these drawer runners installed. And it's kind of funny, these were really hard to install because the router bit I used for the quarter inch grooves had a chip in it which created a keyed profile in the dados and that just meant that there was extra material I had to hammer through when installing the runners and some of these other dividers. Anyways, the glue up was pretty painless, just a little bit of glue here and there, some dowels, some wax with the hand, and some clamps. At the crosscut sled, I snuck up on the right fit for these horizontal dividers. And these are just about an inch or so wide, and that just connects to the drawer runners I installed previously. And like I said, there was a keyed profile here, so I didn't push these in all the way yet until I added glue a little bit later on. I didn't want these to get too stuck, so uh, that's why I did that. And here are some full width dividers, and these are going to be used for areas where there will be a display area. So there won't be drawers in all of the cubbies here. Two of them will be larger areas for displaying something, so I don't want to have uh, the runners visible, so I used full width dividers for those situations. And here I can just flush up the vertical dividers before I glue the horizontal ones in place. Since I've switched to this method of using the runners and dividers like you're seeing here. It's a lot easier for these installs as opposed to having to hammer in uh, full width dividers for all of these. You'll see in the next few frames that I had to hammer in the two full width ones and because of that keyed profile this was pretty difficult but in certain situations even without the keyed profile this can still be a pain in the butt and it also leads to more glue squeeze out and mess to clean up afterwards. So I like the new method that I've been using. It saves on material, makes your projects lighter in weight, and it's just easier overall.
onto the drawers. What you see here is a piece of koa that my uncle gave me a few years back. And it's just been sitting in my lumber rack and I don't know what to use it for because it's kind of a weird shape and uh, this was a good use for it. I I'm going to use it as an accent drawer. So all of the drawers will be walnut except for this one. It'll be front and center with this amazing circular figure on the front and uh, I'm really happy with how it turned out. I'm just getting it fit in both height and width and I did that for all of the drawers. Having drawers of various sizes like this adds a little bit of work because you have to do this for a bunch of different sizes uh, but it's not too much uh, extra work especially for the payoff at the end. So what you see here is the half blind lock joint that I like to use for all of my drawers. I may do another video updating my methods for this because there's a little bit of uh, information I need to add to my old video that addresses doing this for thinner material. So I think my initial video was just talking about half inch stock, but there's a little bit of changes you need to do for three eighths of an inch or quarter inch stock for your side. So if you're interested in something like that, let me know below because that'll motivate me to actually make it. Because every time I do one of these projects, I tell myself that I'm going to do it, uh, but I don't. So let me know what you guys think. From there, I can glue the drawers up, and you can see a little sneak peek into one of my future videos, which is the next mosaic I'm making. This is a lot of work, and it takes a long time for a couple reasons. One is there's just a lot of pieces to place, and two, I just haven't been working on it, so uh, hopefully I get that done soon enough, because it was supposed to be a Mother's Day gift. This edge sander is my new favorite tool, and it makes fitting these drawers so much easier than using just a block plane or a hand sander. Just a little bit of pressure on each face as well as the top and bottoms and I can usually sneak up pretty quickly on a perfect fit. I sanded everything to 150 and then I added some roundovers to all of the edges on both the drawers and the case. After that I then go back to sanding up to 220 and then I can move on to adding some finish. I decided to go with Mahoney's Walnut Oil for the finish here. I haven't used it in a while, but it is a nice finish to use. I'll have it linked below in the description. It is a pretty light duty finish, and it's perfect for something like this. It goes on really easy. Just wipe it on, let it sit for a few minutes, and then wipe it completely dry. You can do one, two, three coats. It really doesn't matter because you can always recoat it down the line, and it'll look great. And the Sapili, especially quarter sawn, always looks fantastic. Uh, and so does this Koa here on this drawer front. The last thing to do was to add the drawer hardware, which was simple enough. And I do apologize for not delivering this last drawer on my mini bike. I completely forgot. Please forgive me. All right, that's it for this build. Thank you once again to Carbide 3D for sponsoring this video and sending me the ShapeOco Pro. I enjoyed the ShapeOco 3 for five or six years, and I'm looking forward to enjoying this one too. It's a great machine and perfect for those looking to get started in the world of CNC. I wanted to show you guys how the CNC fits into my shop, and it's just another tool that helps me make things. In this case, it made a jig, and the great thing is I can make incremental adjustments so that it's more accurate and easier to use. Let me know what you guys think of it. I'm sure there are some obvious things I could do to improve it, and I'm not super skilled in product development, but I want to see where this thing can go. As for the actual wall cabinet, I'm really happy with it. I'll have it listed for sale on the Apothecary Furniture website linked below. The back has a French cleat so that it can be easily hung on the wall to display. If you're interested in seeing things like this while they're in progress, follow me on Instagram at Perloworks. Thanks for watching.